Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call our York County School Board work session to order. We have two topics this evening, very, very important topics. One is a strategic plan update as we um, progress through our year with that, but also we'll have our updated preliminary information reference to our FY16 operating budget. So with that said, um, I'm gonna turn to Dr. Shandor for our strategic plan update. All right, thank you, Mr. Bedford. Um, board members, tonight, Doug Mead is gonna come to the podium. Doug is the Director of Information Technology, and he is going to do a strategic plan update for di digital resources and, and the open data initiative. Mr. Mead. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the board. Tonight I'm updating you on two elements of the strategic plan, one specifically about digital resources and one about our open data initiative. Just for your reference, this is the text from the strategic plan regarding the uh, digital resources. I will be talking to you about benchmarks relating to devices uh, for students and faculty members, the wired and wireless networks, bandwidth, and overall planning for our technology infrastructure. So in the summer of 2014, we replaced our five-year-old wireless network technology which a new, with a new state-of-the-art product from a company called Aruba Technologies. This upgrade replaced 400 existing wireless access points and it added an additional 500 wireless access points to our existing inventory in order to improve the overall coverage for our buildings. We replaced over 1,200 desktop computers and nearly 600 notebook computers for student and teacher use. We implemented a product that allows for self-management of passwords. And you might ask, why does that seem important enough to mention in this strategic plan update? We now provide 24-7, 365 access to our systems for students and teachers. If you have a password that needs to be reset or you forget your password on a holiday or an evening or a weekend when the help desk is not available, you don't have 24-7 access. So having a tool out there that allows for people to self-manage their passwords is a very important component for this type of an environment. We also are quite proud of the fact that we now have fully hosted the AutoCAD program. AutoCAD is the tool used in our high schools to teach mechanical drawings and engineering. So students that used to be limited to using that application inside one specific lab in their, in their school can now use that application from anywhere at any time and on any device. If we built it, they will come, and they did, uh, BYOT. Last year, we were detecting approximately 6,000 devices connecting to our wireless network on a daily basis. First semester this year, 26,000 devices are connecting to our wireless network. It must have been a very good holiday for some people because after the winter break, it popped to 28,000 wireless devices. Now, you say, but we only have 12,500 students and a little less than 1,000 teachers. Techno uh, research shows us that today we should be planning for four to five wireless devices per person. And we're getting pretty close to that when you think that most of our elementary schools students are not bringing in this many devices. What can this consist of? What are the devices? That are <clears throat> iPads, iPods, um, a, a watch, a camera, a notebook computer, you cell name phone, it. A wireless cell phone. Yes, when they come in and they switch over from their 4G to their to our Wi-Fi, cell phones. Yes. So do we know what they're doing on their cell phones? So this just tells you. That this just tells us that they are connecting to our network. That's all we can tell from that. But we consider this to be such an important measure that is now going to be reported to you as one of IT's performance measures, and it was mentioned at the strategic plan update. It takes a lot of infrastructure to support that kind of demand on our network. We increased, yes, ma'am. Can you go over that number just a little bit more? Um, 26,000, 28,000 devices daily, because like, as you said, we've got 
12,500 students. We have people bringing in multiple devices multiple. per person. Yeah, we, we built, when we sized our wireless network a few years ago, the, there's a component to it. We have to sort of make a decision about not the number of access points, but uh, what we call our address ranges. We estimated three devices per person, and that's what we sized our address scheme to. Uh, current research says be expecting four to five per person coming into your building. They they have them on them, and they don't turn them in. They don't turn on airplane mode and turn them off when they come in. They connect. Have we? <clears throat> Done any kind of survey that asks maybe high school students or middle school students how many devices they're bringing to, to school? Because I'm thinking, okay, a cell phone and a laptop or an iPad, uh, if, if each child had one of those, that could get that number and a teacher. But th that 26, 28,000, that just seems it's, extraordinarily high. It's a, it's a lot of devices. These are unique addressed devices connecting to us on a daily basis. Have we done any survey, or do we plan to survey students about the devices they bring? I, I, we haven't had discussions. We have not discussed that. We could we could look into that, but they may not even be thinking about what they're bringing in. As I mentioned, there's now uh, uh, the um, I think it's the Google Watch has an IP address. It looks to connect to the network. I mean, they may not even be thinking about the things that they're walking into the buildings with in their pockets, in their backpacks. They may not use it all day in the building, but they brought it in, and it saw a network, and it connected. So we might gain some information, but it probably won't tell us the whole picture. It's just people just now expect to be connected with whatever they use. I'd, I'd be interested in knowing, and I don't, do we have any kind of a, since we implemented this, which was when? 14. Oh, no, BYOT. Uh, we implemented BYOT three, four years ago. Uh, I can't well, remember. Yeah, it's, it's been several years now. Anyway, you know, just, I don't know, to find out some information, <coughs> how valuable has it been? Um, you know, what do the teachers think? Because I know what some of the teachers think. Um, and I know what the kids think, because I have kids. Um, but, you know, is it, are we accomplishing what we wanted to accomplish with it. I mean, there's there's a certain amount of abuse that's inherent within it. It's got to be. I understand that. But I just, I guess I'd like to think that uh, it's doing what we set out to do and accomplishing what we set out to accomplish. So I don't we, know we do have that. some data. Um, Ashley Ellis, when she was working on her dissertation, it was on BYOT, and that data's been provided to us. And I believe we did follow-up data a year later after she did her dissertation. So we have essentially two years worth of data and I think it was done, I think Miss Ellis's or Dr. Ellis's data was done in 2013 and I think our follow-up data was done in 2014. Did you do surveys? Is that the way she mm -hmm. They did survey data. It might be good to do that again since last year we had 6,000 devices and now we have 28,000. That's a huge jump. <laughs> I mean... Well, my I'm next curious. slide may, may help explain that, all right? Okay. So, Another thing that we've done this year is we have increased our internet bandwidth from 300 meg to 1,000 meg, or basically one gig. So the utility of it has improved tremendously. So with that better bandwidth, there is more <coughs> utilization. So we think that that partially explains it. We went from 45 meg in 2009 to 50 meg in 2010 and 11, 300 meg in 20. 12 and 13 and we're now at a one gig internet connection for the school division. Now you think one gig seems like a tremendous amount of bandwidth, but let me put that in perspective for you. A typical home user today has 25 to 50 meg in their home. If you have a family of four or five, that's 10 to 12 meg per person. With one gig, where you ha we have approximately 70 K, 7,000 kilobits per second. A home user has 150 times more bandwidth at home than we make available to our students and teachers for them to work during the course of the day. So one gig seems like a lot until you put it in perspective. And in fact, a study says that by the 2017-2018 school year, a school district the size of York County should expect to need 15 gigabit to the internet for its internet connection. So as we provide it, they use it. We know that they're already spiking to 800, 850 meg on our gig circuit. That's what I was going to, I mean, I, I look at this and I look at those numbers that you've already flipped through. You don't have to go back to them. <clears throat> but I'm just 
Mr. Mead, I, I'm impressed with the fact that you know our IT department and staff under you through, to build out a system that can take that kind of load. I mean, that is, there's some corporate entities out there that probably wish they could um, <laughs> do what we've done. Um, and then to expand beyond the building, you know, the, where they can have 24-7 access to, which is beyond what you're talking about now. Um, I think it's something to be proud of as a school division. I mean, I would think that other school divisions, do they come knocking on our door going, how did we do it? <laughs> Sometimes, yes, they do. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Mead. Yes, sir. Do you think that the, the bringing on device, <clears throat> the extra load that it puts on our system, are we getting more benefit from that than what we're having to do to serve it? Sir, the IT department builds what it's asked <laughs> to build. <Yeah. laughs> uh, whether or not that the value of that, that's for someone else to yeah. determine. We build what we're asked to build. <laughs> that's a great question. I think that's something that we do have to look a little further yeah. into. And that's kind of what I was getting yeah. at. And, and I, you know, I've done focus groups with students, and I've done focus groups with staffs uh, <laughs> at, at every school except for three and I've been to the, a lot of the high schools and the middle schools and you're right there, there are varying opinions on um, BYOT from staff and from students so but I think it's something that's worth diving into a little further. You know, I think it would be nice as a little journey through what types of things in the during the day that, that this is being used for and I, I mean I, pretty, I think we know what the teachers are using for but in terms of the students right. um, you know, what, what is the benefit there and I'm, I'm sure it's there but you know just having a little review on that would be helpful for me. Yep. Well, I would agree. I think that there's some teachers who have an expertise in technology and they encourage it through the lessons with their kids and some who may not be as comfortable may not be as comfortable with having their students use technology. So I think we're, um, but again, again, more information will help us. Also safety measures. I mean, we don't want the students while the teacher is, um, you know, lecturing or, or providing instruction. We don't want a student watching a video on something else right. that they're streaming and using all of our bandwidth so if we could have an update on any kind of safety measures that uh, the principals and teachers are doing okay. so by 2017 my bar graph will need a bigger slide in order to represent the amount of bandwidth that we're going to need we've also spent a great deal of time in the past several months planning for infrastructure upgrades uh, we have some five-year-old for infrastructure in the form of our storage systems, our servers, and our load balancers. We need about $3.5 million in order to do that refresh because this, this was all technology that we purchased with stimulus money back in 09 and 10, and it has simply come to date. Um, there's really not a lot of change in this. It's just to keep the technology current and working. Other, however, we will be doubling the storage capacity in this particular effort. So a little bit about the budget, because I know we've talked about the $3.5 million figure. If you look at the technology budget, you take everything that we spend for hardware additions and replacements, state technology grants, <coughs> the county rollover money, everything else that we have, we have about $1.7 million for in the annual budget. If you take all of the equipment that we have, servers, storage, uh, network uh, switches, computers, monitors, the peripherals, you take a look at all of the equipment that we have, we need about $2.3 million every year to refresh that equipment on a five-year basis. So when we're asking now for the $3.5 million for the course infrastructure, the critical infrastructure, then that's only a part of the total technology package that we're looking at and that we support and maintain for the students and teachers in your county schools. And one of the things that we're looking at doing is possibly taking that $3.5 million and turning it into an annual lease arrangement where for $700,000 a year, if that was programmed into the budget, then we would just every year pay the $700,000 bill, and in five years, we're, we just renew, we start a new lease on new equipment, and we just keep cycling through. So we don't end up with the $3.5 million every five years shock to the budget. Now, what does this support? Well, there's a lot of critical applications that this supports. 
from all forms of online testing, SOL, interactive achievement, benchmark. It supports our student management system and our Aspen Family Portal that you will have another, that's the second update I'll be giving you tonight. Our email system, our intranet and internet sites, our cafeteria point of sale systems, our library systems, our human resource systems, our transportation systems, Edulog and Laserfish. It supports all of our major systems, but it also supports access, 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 anywhere, anytime, any device. Just for clarification, because I think there might be some confusion when we talk about access, 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 what we really mean by this. If you are a student or a teacher and you have, we did not have the core uh, virtual desktop infrastructure that we're talking about, you basically have access to three things. You have access to the Aspen Family Portal and whatever it may give you. As an employee, you have access to the email system online. And students and teachers have access to the Follett catalog and the eShelf, which is the ebook system. That's what you would have access to, just kind of out of the box, web interfaces to those three applications. This is a sample, this is just a splash list of the applications that students have access to from anywhere, at any time, on any device because of the infrastructure we're supporting. They have access to Microsoft Office. They have access to learning applications. They have access to a whole host. In fact, there's over 60 applications that a student has access to outside of Aspen and the Fall at Destiny. That's provided because of the virtual desktop infrastructure. The students also have access to all of their files. So if they've left a file at school on, their, on the server in their folder, they can go home, pull up that file, and continue to work just as if they were in a class. They have access to the services that the school division subscribes to. Many of these are applications that are either authenticated by a password that is the, the, the division password, it's programmed into our connection, or they are accessed by the IP address of the of the website so it only works from when from within the school division but because of our virtual desktop environment students can have access to these applications just as if they were sitting in their classroom so we've talked a lot about the cost of this I wanted to take a moment and talk about the value proposition of this technology we are very proud of these particular statistics in a recent customer satisfaction survey of our teachers, 58% indicated that they are connecting from outside the division on a daily or weekly basis. 74% indicated that the virtual desktop infrastructure makes their teacher work life easier. 65% indicated that VDI has improved the way they teach. And 30% have changed the way they assign work to students because students have access to so many things from outside the school division. The analogy that I like to use is that in days of old, teachers or students could take their backpack, their book bag, their, uh, their briefcase, they could put their books, they could put their papers, they could put their grade book in, and they could go anywhere and be just as productive as they were in the classroom. And as more and more technology came into the classroom, more and more got tied to the classroom. This turns teaching and learning back around to the way it naturally occurred. They have access to all the resources they need. A teacher can now assign a project to a student because the student can work at it from home, not just in that one computer lab for one period during the, during the day. They have access. And in fact, we know that they're doing it because a few weeks ago, uh, one of our critical pieces of equipment, the Netscaler, mm -hmm. failed uh, late one afternoon. And a message went out, YCSD, anybody know what's up with Aspen and staff emails? They just think it's Aspen and the staff emails. They don't differentiate that it's a piece of the, uh, of the network equipment. And a student also chimed in, while you're at it, can you please fix Aspen? And our, our public relations responded, it's not Aspen, but we are having an access problem right now. 
uh, tech t our team YCSD tech staff are working on it. And then you'll notice the next two. I love Team YCSD, and they should make comics about Team YCSD. I'd buy them. Anybody want to say IT superheroes? <laughs> so these kinds of things indicate that it is actually being used, and when it's offline, they miss it. Any questions about that particular strategic plan update? All right. So the second one is about the open data initiative, specifically talking about access to students, parents, and guardians. A little bit of background. In February of 2012, we implemented the Aspen Student Management System. Aspen had the capacity to replace the GradeQuick and the teacher pages in Edline. It provided for a fully integrated and real-time student management system for both, including the gradebook and family portal. And I think that's very important. This is fully integrated and it operates in real time. In October of 2013, we started a prototype for at uh, York River Academy. In August of 2014, we deployed the family portal for all YCSD students and teachers. And then mid-September, about two weeks after school started, we opened the family portal to all parents and guardians. Students, parents, and guardians have access to teacher class pages. It has the most current information about their academic performance, including grades and averages. Parents can see the student's schedule. They can see daily attendance information. It includes a dynamic calendar that includes assignments that teachers choose to put on their class pages, as well as events and other notices. And if teachers choose to allow it, students can submit their homework directly through the parent through the student portal. It also allows families to better help manage their own information. Keeping such things as co emergency contact information up to date is always a challenge, but when parents can actually see that information is out of date, they can respond to it more quickly. And they can request automatic notifications of attendance problems or low grades, and we offer this at no additional charge for our parents. That was supposed to be a joke. But <laughs> <laughs> now, I was thinking about how we could maybe never mind. <laughs> so for those of you who don't have a uh, student in York County Schools, I thought I would show you a couple of pages out of Aspen. This is a student uh, uh, class page. It shows all of the courses the student is in. It shows their current average, and it shows their attendance record. So a parent can come in and in one place get a quick view of how the student is doing in, the, in the, all of the student's coursework. By clicking on one of the courses over to, oh, and by the way, the grayed out areas, we remove the names to protect the innocent, so the teacher's names and the student name are not there. But by clicking on one of the courses there to the left, you can drill down into, into more information, and you can see their actual scores in specific categories of work, such as classwork, quizzes, tests, projects, and you can see their attendance in a little more detail broken out by quarter. Teachers can produce a class page that gives a description of the class, publish links to resources that the teacher is making available, and allow homework to be submitted. What's really nice about this integrated page is that it also includes right on the teacher's page for the course how the student is doing in that course. The gray box there to sort of to the left, that's unique information about that student right there integrated with the student with the teacher's page so a parent can see a complete picture of what's going on for that particular course and student. So we have 12,513 students approximately. We have 8,816 of them, 70%, have a parent or guardian who has made a connection in Aspen and is able to get real-time information. And of course, 100% of our students and pertinent staff all have accounts in Aspen. So 30% of our families with students in our schools are either choosing not to log in or use Aspen or don't have the capability of using Aspen. And this is this is a similar statistic to where it was with Edline as well. Okay, I was going to ask, is this a, 
national or do you see this a trend? Is this something that all school divisions face about 30%? I, I don't know the don't answer know. to that. that. But this is this is what York County was experiencing pri prior to going to Aspen. It didn't change. We didn't go up or down because of this. The same, you know, approximately the same families that did it before are doing it now. But I don't know how the national averages are. One here, you've got dynamic calendar. What, what does dynamic mean? So when a teacher puts something on their class page that's tied to a calendar, it automatically populates on student calendars. They don't have to go and put it on their own calendar like you might do in your Outlook calendar or something. But they have to put it on there. The teacher does, but then it's on all of the students' calendars that 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 would apply to. And that's you're looking at the top five pages accessed in Aspen, I guess. I'm getting to Oh, that. yeah, 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 you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you read ahead. <laughs> Before we jump too far ahead, I want to go back to that 30%. I yeah. guess one thing that I would like to see, and this doesn't have to be done now, this would be something later on, but mm -hmm. I'll, you know, after we get through done with the budget, but I'd really like to know what's challenging the 30%. What, where, where are the, <coughs> is it access to the technology t or is it just a um, lack of understanding how to use do how do we you know is there a way that we can increase that I don't know what the answer is um, but that would be something I think I would like to explore to see if that becomes something how we get 70 to 80 hmm. you know or beyond and the other piece yeah. with that um, mark I think is for the 30 percent and that teachers has the challenge of keeping up with the 70 and getting everything done but at the same time making having communication mm -hmm. with the parent mm -hmm in addition to the other duties because the 30% of the parents, if they are not having conferences with the teacher, have no idea what's going on with students. And our interim reports are now online. Yeah. So does that mean 30% aren't seeing those? Or the report cards. I mean, it's just a question. Can you tell with this, we know that 70% of students have at least one parent or guardian. <coughs> Do we know how often they get on? Um, or is this as long as they're, they are seen once a year? I have a couple year. of slides that I okay. think might help answer that. All right. Just before you go forward, about the interims and report cards, parents can request a hard or paper copy, and that will be provided. So they do get that information. Okay. Do we know if that number of parents requesting the hard copy is equal to the 30%? Is equal to the 30%. No, no, that's a good piece of, you know, that's a good data piece for us to look at. Is there a divide between them that actually request a hard copy and don't have access to see what that percentage is? But the other piece also is to recognize with Edline, and I'm sure it's the same with Aspen, that we had parents that logged on through their students' log on as well. So that's another piece is that it may not actually be 30% because some of them may be logging on through their student access. And the actual number of parent accounts is lower than 8,000. This because you can you can have a parent with multiple children, mm -hmm. and you can have one parent in the household who's got the account, and both parents are sharing it. So we we know that. So we thought this was a more meaningful number that 8,800 or 70 percent of our students have somebody connecting for them. Mm -hmm. that, that's very true. So that would affect that too, because I know I've got two children at the high school, and I'm accessing the family account. So. Right. So Aspen gives us the ability to track access to individual Aspen pages. And this is just the top five pages that we have that are being accessed in Aspen. And we found it that, and it, and it classifies the access to the page by the group that's accessing it, student, family, staff, and then there's other, and I'll talk about other in just a moment. But students are, are the, the, the top two pages out of the top five are student, and the top in the third one is the family and staff who work in the system day in and day out putting in grades and 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 scheduling students and looking up students they're they're fourth and then we come back the fifth page is back to students so we know students and family are actively <coughs> using the system let me ask a question i think this is the best place to, to kind of come back to that to the calendar have we made in your opinion i don't know who this question should be for but have we made using the calendar more difficult with Aspen than it was with Edline for the teachers? I, I don't know that I can answer that that aspect in terms of because I don't work in Aspen and that piece has not been shared specifically well, with I, me. I can tell you my experience is it's not used as much and you know the 
the Ed Line calendar actually was pretty clear for for me, and and I I guess I wonder have we created work, and if there's a way that we can tweak that as we move along, because a, a calendar is a nice piece to have, um, and we've got some awfully good teachers, and a lot of them will just you know print a calendar and you know put it online for you, which is great, but. Uh, you know, we have this wonderful system, I just think, right. that could be utilized perhaps a little more. And that, that may just be my experience, I don't know. But does anybody else have experience with their own? Uh, I've had a couple of parents contact me about problems that they've had, and calendar was one issue, that they liked the calendar on Edline better. I, I just didn't know if there was anything. I think, I think the calendar on Edline, they were, there was a specific requirement that we had because it didn't populate from another aspect that they had to put. So um, they were required to put tests in major projects. The piece with Aspen that I'm not sure about is whether it's just pulling, and so there, sometimes there's, but I don't know. So I probably shouldn't speculate. <laughs> well, thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do know with Edline that we had a requirement with regard to tests and projects. Okay, so there's no guideline now. So it could be that some are using it, some are choosing not to. So, I, yeah. I don't, I don't, I think the answer, clearly the answer is we don't know. So, I mean, that's something that's worth diving into. More. I think so. You know, for the sake of the, the features, because if it's created more work, I mean, I think it's an important thing to be able to right. use if they can do it, so. And, and I would point out that every system is different, and every system has some advantages and some things that are maybe not as strong in the different system. You know, for instance, uh, Edline, behind the scenes, most people didn't realize a grade quick did not actually compute student grades correctly. So we had a grade book that we had to go through a manual process every marking period to go through and figure out whether or not the grades were right. So, you know, there's, there's always no two systems in my in all of my years of IT have ever been perfect <laughs> so you find you find different things that people like and that work differently um, so this was just a little pie chart uh, with similar with other statistics so teachers and school staff are currently still our, our most significant users overall uh, with almost 49 percent of the system but keep in mind that they were also using the system for two weeks before students returned to school students uh, 30 percent of the total use of the system uh, parents 20 percent keep in mind they were two weeks behind the students and then the other category is school board office staff IT staff that have access to the system that are not actually uh, school staff students or family so there's kind of the breakdown of the total utilization of the system now I put this graph up uh, not to so much to show you individual data points but to basically look at the line so students started having access to the system the first week of school and so you can see from the week before school their their use went from zero and started to climb and as they you know all came on board and tried it for a little while and it sort of peaked and then it sort of started to level off and I think by looking at it we can tell where winter break occurred this year pretty easily um, but this is what I wanted you to see um, we have had two marking at the time I did this graph we'd had two interim reports and a first quarter grade report there was no corresponding spike in the graph so students are just keeping up with their information because we announced that it's a grade card day or an interim report day does not drive the students to the system they're in the system and they're aware again you might and note the uh, the dip there around winter break this is a similar graph for parents their utilization occurred a little later than the students because we didn't turn it on for them for two more weeks but once again you'll see that there's no corresponding jump because we have announced a marking period close they're just in the system they're aware of what their students averages are because they can get real-time averages all the time it's not because we've declared here is a grade card day they're getting real-time useful data I will point out to you that the um, the utilization for parents although it did dip quite a bit around winter break it didn't go to zero so we're suspicious that the parents were using the system to double check the naughty and nice list right there around the holidays <laughs> most likely <laughs> 
And just this is my shock and awe slide. Uh, this is a list of all of the operating systems and browsers that people are using to connect to Aspen with. Uh, yes, you can see up there that they are using their Nintendo Wii's, their Sony PlayStations. They are using just about anything that you can imagine to connect to our system with. So they're, they're finding ways to get online. Can we sell that information to the corporate world, baby? <laughs> Some trending. Uh, any questions on that update? Um, one issue about Aspen, uh, it's a recent issue after the midterms. Many parents and students were trying to get that real-time information and find out what the midterm, grade, midterm test grade was. And there was no place for teachers, I guess, to post the test grade, the midterm test grade for high school students. And um, I'm not sure if that's anything that can be worked out for next year. Post midterm test grade. I, I, I'll have to look into that, but okay. I will I will get you an answer to that. Thank you. Right, and I had a chance to talk to Troy Graves about that. When it comes to averaging first semester grade, you need the first quarter grade, you need the second quarter grade, and the exam grade, and then they're in the calculating mode. And so until we release the final semester grade, it's still in the calculation mode, so it's not visible. Mm -hmm. Until all teachers have completed all their grading, and we have what we call a grading window, that you can start to input grades on this date. Then I think the Thursday before report cards were due, then the window's closed, so now all calculations are in. We can double check and make sure things are right. Then on Monday, the day the report cards were issued, everything is visible. I think when you log into Aspen, during that break, that was a notification about they were in grading mode or whatever the terminology was, but it didn't explain the piece about the exam grade. Right. So going forward, we need to explain the exam grade so when parents would log in during that period of time, you would see that the exam grade is not available now, and then the suggestion was to email the teacher for the grade, because right now, Aspen is in another mode of calculating the final semester grade, so that's not available, and that's why you couldn't see it because they are used to that real-time so, information absolutely. and they want to find out what they made on that midterm test. It's 20% right. of their grade. Right. So they were very anxious about that and I heard a, I heard a lot of chatter about uh, wanting sure. to see that test grade. And I'll con continue to work with Troy and Doug with too on if that's available, but I know they're in another mode in Aspen. That makes it difficult to show that. Thank you. Mr. Bede, we're um, very well done. Um, my question is, Dr. Shandor, is it possible that if us board members wanted to set up a time you could arrange with um, Mr. Bede and his, um, a couple of his people. So when, we, when we're talking servers and storage and these huge pieces of, I'm, I'm thinking a room with a bunch of stuff, um, to get a visual, to take us on like a little mini field trip to a server room or a, um, a bank of, this is the control sy systems of the YCSD, just to get an idea of you know what that looks like, mm -hmm. just what does it feel like. Um, so when we talk about and we hear and we listen to the expense and what it's going to take to keep our infrastructure going, what the infrastructure looks like. Yeah, we can certainly do that. So te technology infrastructure 101. Yeah. We can certainly set that up for you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're moving into our update of preliminary information on the FY16 operating budget. We've been working on this quite a bit so far. We've had two good uh, joint work sessions with our board supervisors, our counterparts. And so um, now as we continue moving forward. Uh, is it all right if we do, we have one more strategic plan update? Oops, I skipped one. So we're gonna have, if it's Sorry all right. about that. Yes. We're gonna, if we can move to. Ahead. That's all right. Um, if we should have had it listed on the agenda for everyone to see. If we're Dennis Jarrett is now going to present strategic plan update for goal three, objective A for teacher compensation, um, goal five, objective A for allocation of resources, and goal five, objective B for performance measurements. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shandor. Uh, you have some information in your packets tonight, too, and I'm, I'll be going over that very briefly here. But the, the first one I want to present to you tonight is uh, objective 3A, which falls under recruitment and in retention, okay? And this is a very important objective that the school board set, which deals with teacher compensation. And I would direct your attention to the FY15 target. Your target for FY15 was to be ranked four or better 
on the teacher pay plan. Now, I would remind you that a year ago, we did a complete study on the teacher pay plan. That was completed and implemented. And that study actually raised the scale up. And so that was one of the things we had working for us as we moved into fiscal year 15. So with that objective, let's take a look at what actually has occurred. Okay. This is a graph that um, we put together to kind of demonstrate where the scale ranks relative to our peers. Now, I would remind you that our peers are really, they're uh, Weensburg, Newport News, Hampton, Norfolk, Portsmouth, Virginia Beach, um, let's see, uh, Chesapeake. Okay, that's the folks that you have identified as you want to compete with in terms of your salary schedules for teachers. Now, what this graph does, it takes our current pay scale and it compares it to the pay scales of our comparators with one exception, and that is we adjusted their pay scales to come to the same place we are with the VRS shift that we were required to do. Now, let me explain that to you. If you think about it, your county right now, your county schools, we have shifted 4% of the VRS to our employees. There are two other school divisions that have not. Virginia Beach and Suffolk has, has shifted 3%. All the other school division, divisions have shifted all 5%. So we had to level out the pay plans, if you will, to try to make sense of the comparison. So that's what we did. What we did was we took your county at four, and for the ones that were already at five, we took 1% off of their pay scale. For those that were at three, we added 1% on it to try to bring some sense of comparison. And I know it's not extremely perfect, but it does work for the comparison. Now, if you think about that, when, when, we, when we did this scale comparison, we, took, we ranked every step every step on our pay plan with our comparators. So if you look at the bachelor's pay lane, and by the way, there are 31 steps on our pay plan. It starts with step zero and it goes to step 30. So there's 31 steps. If you look at the rank four or better, which is what your goal is, okay, we had 23 steps on the bachelor's pay lane, which met that criteria. So that was 74 of our steps met that criteria for the bachelor's pay lane. Using that same logic, go to the master's pay lane. We had 24 steps that met the criteria of rank four or better. That was 77%. Go to the next. Look at the master's and the doctorate. We had 100% of our steps ranked four or better. I think that's just a phenomenal achievement. And the staff that are on those particular pay scales are staff that Actually, I don't think they could go anywhere else and make a higher pay. I mean, I mean, we are at the top. There it is. I mean, so it's a very good sign for that. Now, what I was really excited about was that last column where it talks about the number of staff. Remember that rank four or better only looks at the steps on the scale. It's not looking at the number of people that are on each of those steps. The next um, column shows that on the bachelor's pay lane, where people are actually on the scale, 90% of the staff are actually on a step that ranks four or better, 90%. 90% of the masters, and then 100% of, ma uh, of the masters plus 30 and the doctorate. This is the first. I mean, th this, is, this, is, this is pretty impressive. I mean, you have a pay scale that, in my opinion, from an external equity basis, extremely competitive for the teachers extremely competitive. Now, I do not want to mislead anyone watching this presentation. We do have that internal equity issue that we're working through, and that's compression. We do have the situation where we have a teacher that maybe have six years of experience on step one, and we have another teacher with one year of experience on step one. That's an internal equity issue. That's not external. This is looking at the external piece. And I would say in looking at this, there's clearly you've met your objective for fiscal year 15. And um, now what's the challenge? The challenge is to keep this. And I will tell you, that's going to be difficult. Because remember, when you do a step increase, you're not increasing the scale itself. 
If you do a step, people are just moving up based on years of service. If another school division does not do a step but does a market adjustment to their pay scale, then that can push us down. You follow me with this? So the point of that is it's important that when we talk about steps each year that we also talk about scale adjustment because we want to remain competitive to our comparators that we have identified. And if they're going to be adjusting their scales, we want to be in a position that we're doing something similar or more than to maintain our position. Remember, your ultimate goal is to be ranked three. That's where, you're, that's where you want to be by fiscal year 2017. Now, we've got a long way to go to get to rank three, but I tell you what, we've made, a great, made great strides at this so far. When you say market adjustment, market adjustment and restored step, are you using those? Uh, they are not synonymous. Terms synonymous. They, are, they are not. They are not. No, no. Okay. Uh, step is just take the current pay scale, and a teacher's here for one year, you provide a step for them, they move up to like from step one to step two. A market uh, adjustment is when you go in, raise the entire scale up. Entire scale. Higher scale. So a restored yeah. step just simply just moves you up the current scale. A scale adjustment or a market adjustment increases the entire scale. Like a cost of living raise. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. Exactly. Now I do want to remind you on this this second uh, page uh, of this. I just I just footnote the information about what school divisions have done the VRS shift and at what percentages. Any questions on this one um, before we move on to the next one? Let's go over to efficiency and safety. And the first one let's talk about is allocation of resources. This is, a, this is one of those objectives that um, it really encompasses a lot of information. In fact, I, I, would, I would probably argue that uh, there are a number of graphs and charts in our budget that really do lend itself to this meeting this objective. So we're not going to go through all of those, but I do want to just point out a couple of items. And th this allocate, let me just first say allocation of resources. What this objective is about is resources will be allocated to maximize student achievement. Okay? And so what we're doing is we're trying to look at how we've allocated the resources and are they making a, I guess a positive uh, uh, effect, having a positive effect on what's going on with uh, students in the classroom and how they're, they're achieving. Well, in order to do that, let's take a look at some areas. The first bullet is the budget reductions that took place from fiscal year 10 through 13. Um, I would just remind uh, everyone about those because those were very difficult years for the division. And during those times, we really tried to maximize the resources staying in the classroom and make reductions outside of the classroom. I know Dr. James and his operation, they had, they had uh, uh, severe cuts. Technology was one of the areas we cut. Buses was one of the areas we cut. Uh, we cut textbooks. We cut staff, cut 159 teachers during that time period. So those were things that we did. But I will say that if you look at the next bullet, instructional expenditures were reduced less than expenditures at the school board office and in operations and maintenance. Um, I think that clearly is an indication that we're trying to maximize the allocation of the resources so that they have the greatest impact on the classroom. Um, in fact, um, in fiscal years, we did not uh, reduce any teaching positions until fiscal years 13 or 14. So all the reductions that were done during those other years were done outside of the classroom in terms of teachers. Then if you go on down, there's, there are qualitative and quantitative mark, uh, benchmarks, if you will, all throughout the budget document. But there's one chart that I want to show you, and it's called Academic Efficiency of Dollar Spent. This is actually a requirement that the, you, you know, we participate in the Meritorious Budget Awards Program. And about three or four years back, they came up with a new criteria that said, if you're going to apply for this award, you have to include some information about academic efficiency of dollars spent. And this is how we met that requirement. This is what we did was we took this, uh, we took data, we took expenditure data first. And I have to, all this information here is based on fiscal year 2013. And we had to use 2013 because the, super, uh, the state superintendent 
superintendent's annual report for 14 has not been issued yet. So we're using the data that is available to us. Look at the top chart and you'll see that the per pupil expenditure for York is second to last. Second to last. In fact, if you were to go to Hampton's level of expenditure, you're probably looking about maybe another, based on our student population we have now, we'd have about another $4 million to work with if we were spending at the Hampton school division level per pupil. So I, what that first chart tells us that, okay, your county is very efficient in the dollars they're spending. They're spending next to last in their comparator group. But then look at the next three graphs down at the bottom. They're all <coughs> academic performance measures. I, I would say this, you're going to be hard pressed to find another school division that, that has these kind of benchmarks and these kinds of uh, statistics to show. I mean, we, we are number one. I mean, I think, so when you look at this graph, I don't think there's any question that the allocation of resources over the last six years have been beneficial to the classroom and to our students in their uh, achieving uh, their goals for um, for uh, uh, grades and so forth, and and ultimately for uh, getting into colleges. Um, I, I will tell you these are these are pretty impressive numbers, and I know you've heard all these things before from Dr. Guy and her presentations and so forth. But when you look at it in the totality of what we have to work with, I think it really adds a different flavor to it. It's one thing to talk about being number one, but it's another thing to talk about being number one spending next to the last amount of revenue exactly. dollars that the, your, your competitors are spending. So, um, any of it. So that's what we have for allocation of resources. Any questions on that? This is very impressive, and we really should be. This entire county should be so very proud of the public education that we provide students, and it's um, a testament to the staff and to the families who make education a priority. This is most impressive. Uh, Ms. Kursky, I would, I would, uh, you're exactly right, and I would also say that the teachers. Um, you know, the teachers have been, you know. That's what I meant when I said staff. I, I know it is, I know it is, I know it is, but I just wanted to, I just wanted to get that out there because, um, you know, I, I think back to those four years where they got no increase at all, right. nothing. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it this is fiscal year 13. Increase. This was right on the tail end of that. I mean, so these folks are out there on the front line every day doing their job and doing it well. And I think they deserve a lot of credit for this, as you exactly. pointed out. Now, the last objective we're going to look at is again on <clears throat> efficiency and safety, and it deals with performance measures. This is objective um, 5B, and finance does a number of things to measure performance, and we do trend analysis on that as well. So I'm not going to go over all of this. I'm just going to highlight a couple of them, but I will say, and you have this in your packet as well, we have 38 performance benchmark, benchmarks that we use. And um, we have met all of those benchmarks for the last three years. And um, I would say that the benchmarks that we put out there, I tend to like, uh, what the benchmarks I like to use are benchmarks that mean have meaning to us. And for example, the first one, obtain an unqualified opinion uh, from, on our audit that we do each year on the comprehensive annual financial report. You would not want to see an audit that doesn't have an unqualified opinion. So we meet that one. The one right below it is dealing with the student activity fund audit. And that's one that the principals and bookkeepers have a lot of input into. And I give them credit for a lot of that being, a, being an unqualified opinion. Moving on down, there's a couple of others I would point out to you. This is one that uh, we try to really focus on, and that's payments. Uh, make payments within 10 business days of receipt of the invoice. Uh, this is why is this important? Because if we can take discounts, sometimes vendors will offer a discount for early payment. We do that. And um, also, it, it's a good, I guess you might say it's a good business practice when vendors know that we're going to pay them promptly. They, they, they're more encouraged to do business with us. So we met that requirement as well. And let's see what else I want to put up. P card holders. As you know, we have Okay, we have what we call P-cards. We have over 100 of those in the division. What that is, is that's a, that gives the, uh, the person that holds a P-card has the ability to go out and spend money using what effectively it's very much like a credit card. There are some different variations to it, though. And they can go out and do that, and then it gets approved by their supervisor and gets charged to their account. 
what we do is in finance we audit every p card holder every year so every year you're going to get an audit and what we do is if we see any discrepancies in that we bring it to the attention of the p card holder and their supervisor why is that important that's important because we're holding people accountable you know we want to make sure that if someone is going out and buying something that they're buying something that's legitimately for the division and that's where the supervisor's review comes in that as well because they're reviewing it for the same thing and so that's an internal audit procedure that we use in our department I won't, I'm not going to go through any more of these but I, I would encourage you to look at those because there is a lot of good information in that and there's a lot of work that goes into completing these and I'd be glad to answer any questions at this time you might have on any of this um, just to Again, the comments that were made about the allocation of resources. Um, we are first across the board in accomplishments um, and next to the last for the pupil expenditure. And our teachers have stepped up to the plate and shown their dedication. And the question that I just leave with you is how long can we ask them to continue to do what they do or what they get? Yeah, I, I think that you as a board are you've you've made compensation your priority superintendent's made it his priority um, and we're going to do everything we can to make compensation uh, work in the division but you know I, I think that unfortunately a lot of, the, of it is out of your control to an extent I mean you can only work so far with the resources you have and that's where the challenge is getting the various providers of refunding to the division to step up and do what's necessary to, so that we can provide those kinds of increases for staff that we need. I would say right now one of the biggest challenges to the school division is, is internal equity, res restoration of steps, because um, right now I think you've got you've got a morale problem. <coughs> because if I'm a teacher and I'm on, I'm on the same step as a teacher that's been, and I've been here six years, the teacher's been here one year, you know, that that's a problem. I mean, and, and I think there's a lot of organizations grappling with that. In fact, we were talking earlier about the state is grappling with compression. Yeah. Uh, they're talking about trying to find some ways to cure that. Um, the, it, this is nothing specific to York County because raises just weren't being provided and steps were being provided four years ago. But I would say this, we cannot let go and we cannot, uh, I guess, pull back on this. We've got to keep moving forward with the, with the compensation items that we have. And you're going to be hearing more about that in a few minutes from Dr. Shandor when he talks about his proposed budget. But Mrs. Haywood, I will tell you that I think you're in good company with the rest of us and that we feel that compensation is, is very important. And But we do have parameters that we have to do this under, and I think that's where the rubber hits the road in it. And um, But hopefully, hopefully maybe we uh, as we move forward into hopefully better economic times, we can do more with, with that. Um, I would say your pay scale is extremely competitive right now, but we've got one more step to go. We want to get the rank three, and that's gonna that's gonna put some pressure on us. Get the rank three, and then we got to look at those restoration of steps. Don't have to do it all in one year, but we need to be chipping away at that over time. This this is you know great news about the the pay scale and all. Actually, it's it is this is really great news. I'm, I'm assuming. A lot of this is the new pay plan that we that we put in place. You know, that, it's part of it's part of that, but you know, yeah, you, you have to look at this thing too from the standpoint we had a fairly competitive pay scale before that, but what the pay scale has done now, it's more equitable, if you will, and I think that adds a little bit more, I guess, um, validity to our pay plan as we compare to other localities. Yeah. So uh, we we've been competitive over the last several years on our pay plan. Um, that's not been really the big issue. Um, the big issue over the last several years is the internal equity piece. But I would say the pay plan analysis that we did a year ago made more equitable distribution of the steps, and it also lifted the scale it lifted up. up. It lifted the scale up, which made us more competitive. It was a dual prong kind of approach to it. This can be so deceiving because it's so dependent upon other other divisions. I mean, you know, they could sort of control your destiny, if you will. Right? So I like to use the analogy of a, we're, we're in a, a car race. We're going around the track right now. We may be leading right now, but we don't know what's going to happen in that last lap. Someone may decide, okay, we won't do a step this year. We'll do a 3% across the board. If they do that, these numbers all change. So, yeah, we're in a car race, and we'll have to wait and see where, we, where, we, uh, where the checkered flag falls at the end of this thing. It's like uh, Virginia Beach proposing 
I saw that. Yeah. There, there was discussion about that. Of course, I talked to someone in Virginia Beach, and they said, <laughs> well, don't know where we're going to get the money from to do that. But there was, there was discussion about that. And, and so, you know, there's some positive things out there as we move forward with this. But I think, you know, Dr. George, you're exactly right. This is extremely positive news. And I think it's something I think our staff should be proud of. Um, you know, they're working in a system that values compensation, values what they do, and your pay plan shows it. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Are we in need of a break? Are we done with strategic plan now? We are. <laughs> As I jumped ahead on the, I'll just saw, thought that was, I didn't know we had two topics. Um, all right. Now we're going to move into our operating budget. For FY16, actually, the superintendent's proposed. So, um, Dr. Shandor, turn it back to you. All right. Dennis, I'm going to ask you if you'll pull that. Yes, yeah. All right, um, Mr. Jared is going to drive for me. Yeah. He's going to drive. That's exactly. Let me get my helmet up. Right, exactly. <laughs> right now we're on lap two. Um, Stay on the track. So tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the operating budget for FY16, and I can tell you that developing a school division budget is quite a challenging process. Weighing the wants and needs of the school division is challenging. My main focus is for us to be good stewards of the funds and ensuring that we're being fiscally responsible. Understanding that our mission is to engage all students in learning the skills and knowledge needed to make productive contributions in the world. Therefore, the focus of this budget is to support our mission and the strategic goals. So we'll go ahead into the first slide. I always like to start off with sharing accomplishments uh, of the school division and our students and our staff. Um, as you know, we're one of 22 school divisions in Virginia to be fully accredited. Um, all of our middle schools exceeded the state average for science performance. Our class of 2014 exceeded the state and national averages on the SAT. And our on-time graduation results exceeded state averages. And York County School Division's graduation rate last year was 94.5, which I think is extremely impressive. So the slide you're looking at, um, Dennis just stole my thunder through his presentation, but um, this view, if you look at this, it displays our per pupil expenditure compared to the other localities. And, and you just saw where we're next to last in, in this, on this slide. Now I want to spend a few minutes to talk to you about the reductions in my proposed budget. So on this slide, you're looking at 1.8 million of reductions through attrition, health insurance, and BRS reductions based on the governor's proposed budget. So now I want to dive into the priorities. You've heard me talk for the last few months about the three budget priorities. Again, staff compensation, transportation, and technology. So when you're looking at the first priority, staff compensation, our workforce, I'm sorry, staff compensation, our workforce, the people who make up this wonderful school division, they're our number one priority. I think we can, we can all agree to that. We have 890 teachers. We have 850 staff members who support them. The total cost for this priority will be $2.4 million. So looking at some of the specific information, this slide indicates the cost breakdown for licensed and non-licensed staff. So the cost will be $725,000 for a step for licensed staff, which is 1.4%, and $291,000 for the scale adju adjustment of 0.6%. And then for non-licensed, $525, um, with, which is, again, an average of 2% for that step for non-licensed staff for a total of $1.54 million. It is important to note that this does not provide funds to restore any of the five steps lost in prior years. Now, on the next slide, this slide does indicate the cost to restore a step for all eligible staff members. And the total for licensed staff and non-licensed staff for restoring one step for those eligible will be $908,000. This bring, brings the grand total for compensation for our staff and YCSD to $2.4 million. In recent years, to protect the classroom, our bus replacement funds were reduced, as we've talked about for the last few months and Dennis indicated this evening, by $400,000 or 50%. So in looking at the second priority, as I've stated, we have 169 total buses. Presently, we have 23 that are over 14 years old and or have over 200,000 miles um, on them. 
We're looking at utilizing these funds to replace buses over the next several years in order for us to get back on track with our normal replacement cycle. The cost is $400,000 to replace four buses and $100,000 for vehicle parts and supplies. Again, you heard Mr. Mead speak this evening a little bit about technology. The area of technology also has been impacted in recent years to the tune of about $700,000. Again, all of this in order to protect the classroom. I do want to remind the board and the public that these funds will not be used for shiny new objects. They'll be to maintain and refresh only a portion of our technology infrastructure. So this slide has some of the specific totals on them. As technology supports major classroom tools such as Aspen, ben Benchmark, and SOL testing and all the other ones that um, Mr. Mead shared this evening, the cost for, again, partially replacing storage units, servers, and net scaler equipment is $800,000. Now I've shared my main three priorities, however there are a few other items which are not as significant in total dollars to the school division budget, but they are important. First. This is the last year of the mandate, meaning we must complete the VRS shift to employees, which is the remaining 1%, which equals 150,000. Following suit, in the past, the school board has provided a tenth of a percent to hold staff harmless regarding the tax impl implications of this mandate, which will cost us 76,000. And then I'm also pleased to report that there will be no increase in the Delta Premier dental rates next, next plan next year and only a very modest increase in the Delta care rates. Delta care rates will increase between $1 and $3 per month depending on the plan selected and I'm recommending that the increase be passed to participating Delta care plan members. There will be no changes in benefits for either plan. Now as we're expecting an increase of 250 students based on our projections for next year, this slide is critically important. It's important to understand that the school board has a vision and a mission which is student focused and a strategic plan goal and objective which directs our average class size to 25 or less at the elementary level and 30 or less at the secondary level in core classes. The school board should be commended for the last six years of being able to maintain this low teacher student ratio across K-12. With that said, due to increases, increases in enrollment this year, we added four regular ed teachers above what was originally bu budgeted. So again, next year we'll need an additional four teachers in, in FY16. In FY15, we added four special ed teachers above what was originally budgeted and need two more in FY16. As a reminder, those positions are, are federal and state requirement. We'll also need to add two regular paras for 16 and an additional 20,000 for materials and supplies. Finally, this slide includes the cost for virtual high school, textbooks, New Horizons, and student testing materials. With the resources we have, it's important to note that we believe we will meet our textbook requirements for FY16 with a $50,000 increase. This is another example of an area where additional resources will be needed in future years. Additionally, I've added these moderate increases for county shared services, for video services, and school resource officers. So this evening I've shared expenditure priorities as well as areas in the budget that I propose we reduce. Now I'd like to review how I propose to fund the expenditure priorities. As you can see, our revenue outlook for FY16. The House Appropriations Committee in conjunction with the governor's proposed budget provides revenue increases over a little over 1.6 million. Now I'm gonna ask Dennis to, to make a few comments about that proposal update. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. Um, just, just a, uh, what we're doing this year is a little bit different than what you've seen in the past. You've typically seen us go with the governor's proposed budget at this point, and then when the General Assembly approves a budget, we move forward with that. Um, what's different this year is on Sunday, the House Appropriations Committee and the Senate Finance Committee released their budgets. Now, those budgets are going to go to the full uh, House and the full Senate for approval later this week. Um, everyone anticipates that to be approved, for the, at least for the budget bill. What makes it different this year, though, is the two bills for K-12 education are almost identical, if not identical. Um, I can't, there's not enough information out on, on the Senate side for me to determine if it's exactly like the House side, but the way it reads, it sounds like it is identical to the Senate. Uh, the Senate and the House are, are the same. Now, why is that important? That's important because eventually this is going to go to a conference committee. 
And if they both already agree on funding for K-12 education, one would like to think that, okay, well, that's kind of like off the table. They'll be talking about other things. Um, so with that, both the House and the Senate uh, committees recommended a 1.5% increase for teachers and support staff. Now, I want to qualify that. That's for SOQ teachers and support staff. We have a number of staff, especially on the uh, uh, not on the on the support side that aren't even included in the SOQ funding formula. So even though it's one and a half percent, it doesn't fully fund a one and a half percent for us, but it does provide additional funding to meet those objectives that Dr. Shandor talked about a few minutes ago. So what this means is this, is that the proposal for the state line item that you see on this slide is using the House Appropriation Committee's proposal. Okay. And that proposal increases the amount that the governor had proposed by about $560,000. So we're adding that in. Okay. Now, I need you to know that if for any reason the General Assembly does not approve the House Appropriation Committee's proposal and the Senate Finance proposal that goes to conference, then this number is going to change and it's going to it change significantly. But I think the way it looks right now, it looks pretty positive between the two groups that I've, that they could very well be, you know, on, on in agreement already on K-12 funding. Of course, then it goes to the governor. Then the governor has to decide what he's going to do with this. But it will all hopefully be worked out by the end of the month because the General Assembly is slated to end on February the 28th. If they do, then it goes to the governor for his signature. So hopefully keeping our fingers crossed and rubbing a rabbit's ears and everything else, <laughs> a rabbit's foot, is that when we get together in March, when we, get to, <laughs> when we get together in March, we will be able to tell you what the General Assembly has approved. Okay, so uh, <laughs> a rabbit foot, let's say. <laughs> um, but, but in any event, I think that it's, it's a positive sign, so we're going to go ahead and load that in for now. But I do need you to understand that if something changes between now and when it, what's approved, I mean, it would change these numbers up here okay and to add that and to bring back that compression compression issue it was interesting to read some of the stuff that was coming out because they're talking about it richmond and everyone there is talking about compression compression they're actually coming up with numbers how to deal with um, yeah. some of the short-term aspects of compression with the again with the state employees and, and the state police employees um so it was interesting to to reflect on that because We've been talking about it for years, and now it's become an issue that's... That's the first time I've seen a public acknowledgement exactly. of, of what's going on at the state level. Not to say it hasn't been done. It's the first time I've seen it. First time I've so, heard it. So I, I think that, again, is a positive thing that, you know, it kind of gets us in the mode of talking about that as well. So so I think you're right, Mr. Maffert, very positive. And when you were bringing it up in Richmond in the past couple of years, you got a little song and dance uh -huh. about all the priorities, and this year it wasn't in my experiences up there at Mrs. Haywood, today we noticed that they realized they're in trouble too. Yeah. It's a different story. Yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, folks are, have been asked to do a lot, and I'm not just talking about school division folks. I'm talking about county employees, city employees, state employees have done a lot over the last probably six years to make the budgets balance, and I think now the pendulum needs to swing back a little bit for some of these folks so that they can start seeing some of their the work that they've done over the last six years and not been compensated for it. So I think that's what people are coming to grips with, Mr. Minner, and I think you're right about it. All right, All right. I'll, I'll jump back into um, federal impact aid. Um, we're going to see a decrease in $300,000. DOD heavily impacted, we're gaining over $71,000. Um, so all in all, my recommendation for the county contribution is an increase of over 1.6 million or a 3.2% increase. Finally, we have a little over 50,000 in local miscellaneous funds as well. So the total revenue increases are approximately $3.1 million. So um, all of this information I'm sharing with you tonight is included in my proposed FY16 budget, will be which will be released later this week. In YCSD, we have needs in many areas, and I recognize that. We need to be reasonable in our approach. 
This budget proposal is based on the needs of the school division and is fiscally responsible. Um, we're not in the position to address each of the cuts that we've made for the past six years. However, we can and we must begin to make progress in ensuring that we have the necessary resources to address our students' needs and support our highly dedicated staff members. Um, school board members, do you have any additional questions or comments at this time? Just make one observation. I think <clears throat> I, I really want the, the community and the public to know how important this per pupil expenditure comparison is. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're ninth, but we're first in the uh, academic markers, which is you know, a tribute to everybody that does what they do for the division. You know, the flip side is sometimes in people's minds they go, well, hey, they're doing great. You know, let's just yeah, yeah. kind of leave them alone. They get plenty of money to do because look, look at the results they're getting. And that's just always a double edged sword. Yes, but, is. you know, I, I think it's important to know what all goes on behind the scenes and what it takes to, to accomplish this. And, uh, you know, the, it's the secret sauce, and I don't want to give it away. You know, <laughs> we have, it's, it's, it's rubbing it's, rabbit ears together, it's apparently. It's working, yeah. You know, but, <laughs> but I think it's that's so significant, and I hope that the viewing public understands how uh, fiscally responsible they are with their funds. I think that's well put because it is. It really speaks to fiscal responsibility, and it speaks to being efficient at what we do. And I think that's what the number is telling you. We're efficient at what we do, and we are responsibly putting the money where it goes, should go, which is in the classroom. And I think that's what really what the information is sharing that you're seeing. Uh, and Dr. George, I think too, you look at that number, and you start. I start reflect. I mean, yes, we're very proud of where we are. We, you know, we have maintained and even gone beyond our, you know, levels of achievement with our students in, in most cases. But it makes me kind of sit, step back and go, okay, are we asking our staff uh, to put so much stuff on their plate over the years, more and more, just keep adding it to the plate because we can't hire an extra person, we can't have that extra para, we can't have that extra teacher. You know, or custodian, we add the square footage to our buildings, but we can't hire the new custodian to help take up some of that. And they're, I mean, they are feeling it. So I think in some cases we have overworked, stressed out, in some cases really struggling to get the job done at the end of the day before they got a clock out of Kronos to go home because they can't work past and they can't work for free. And I think as we start evaluating some of that, um, yes, our numbers look good. We've got the lowest student you know, cost per pupil, but what is it? What, what cost does that come with? I mean, our teachers have and our staff have stepped up. And they are now, I mean, we're stepping up, looking at compensation. We talk about it every year, but um, I think they just got a lot of stuff on their plate. That's why we've been able to maintain. I think so. I think there are a lot of factors. I, I certainly, you don't want that to be at the expense of any group. You know, you, we, we don't want that. And if we ever see that happening, we need to mm -hmm. definitely need to change it. But I think there's some things just, you know, our buildings in Will County. I mean, we don't, there are divisions that have these big Taj Mahals and the big old, it's you know, we're pretty, we're pretty basic. Exactly. I mean, we really are. And we, and we make do with what we have and we add on and we, we renovate. And I think that goes a long way. So, you know, there's certainly issues like that that contribute greatly, I believe. We just have a, we have a good team, YCSD as they call it, um, that take pride right down to the HVAC technician or the plumber. I mean, everyone, the bus driver that greets the kid in the morning, everybody takes pride in what they're doing, but they have been asked to do more. Mm -hmm. Right. And one thing you said, and they don't technically check out, as Mr. Mead just told us, they've got 24 7 access right. to Aspen and their grade book and their lesson plans. So, um, how many hours do they work at home? Yeah. Exactly. Quite a few, I would say. <laughs> Any other comments or questions of the superintendent? All right, so we're underway. Um, the superintendent proposed budget will hit the street this week. Um, we're going to have further discussion as a board. Um, I encourage our community and um, the people listening at home and through the press. If you have questions or comments, please let us know. Email us, call us, um, because this is our time to hear from you, the, the community, on our next steps as we move through the budget process. For the staff, thanks a bunch. A lot of hard work to do this left. Dr. Shandor, good job. Thank you. Anything else for the better of the business? We're adjourned. Good night, everyone. Good night.